I don't carry any objects per se. I carry um, yeah. my keys so I don't get locked out of my flat. I used to have a hagstone around my neck, a very little one, but no more. I think I, uh, the string broke. I lost it. I found that hagstone when I was actually working on the, the pictures that are currently in your gallery. It was a very small hagstone, like, like, like the heart of a rabbit. It was a small hole, very delicate hagstone. But it's gone, as I say, lost. Mostly they're sort of epithets, swearing. I kind of, I tend to, I swear, over swear. I swear a little bit too much, I think. In response to many things, my, my sort of stock response is, is to swear, kind of blaspheme, swear, like uh, exclaim rudely and in, in, with a kind of constant air of, of staggered disbelief at what I'm having to listen to. That's, so I, I, I overuse profanity generally. Uh, yes, I have. I have. The first artwork I bought was in about 2007. And I was in Rotterdam and I bought a large, very big um, photograph um, that was mounted onto aluminium behind a sheet of perspex. And it was, um, it was a three three dead rats in various states of decomposition. Um, and I can't remember the title, but it was a sort of metaphor for the, for, for the end game of late period Western capitalism, I feel. Um, today I ran um, for a little while, for an hour and a half or something, um, through the suburbs of, of, of Brighton. Um, and then I had a little sleep. And then I went to my studio where I carried on painting these um, landscapes that I'm working on, which are sort of a, a, a sort of pop art version of a blend of cartography and topography, um, focusing on the um, so-called sacred sites of the British Isles. Well, funny enough, I'm a massive hippie. And uh, because of being a hippie, I used to be a bit of a kind of one of those traveler people with the, with the sort of, you know, army surplus clothes and uh, spliffs and cans of strong lager. And um, a, lot of, a lot of that, there's a lot of, uh, there's a very mystical side to that sort of youth subculture or subculture. Um, you know, hence, you know, hence the, the Stonehenge festivals, um, which, which are, don't happen anymore, but they did. And all, hence the, the, the Glastonbury Festival, Glastonbury Tour is a very mystical site. Glastonbury Town itself is, is supposed to be some sort of, you know, cradle, some sort of omphalos of spirituality in the British Isles. Yeah. And, and um, people are also, you know, I'm, I'm very drawn to stone circles, tumuli, sacred landscapes. Avebury is another one, West Kennet Long Barrow, Silbury Hill. So I'm kind of, I, I know where these places are. So what I'm doing is, um, is getting a, a, a what do you call it, um, close range, large scale ordnance survey map that shows all the field boundaries, all of the paths, all of the tumuli, all of the details of the landscape. And then I, I take up a, a little section of the map and then simplify it to try to find the old routes through it, like the old trackways, the driftways, drove roads and the modern features and then I divide it all up with with all these lines that humanity has put on the landscape mm. and um, I use very bright 
pop art colors, plastic paint, you know, acrylic is plastic. And most of the dyes that color them are derived from the petrochemical industry. So it's a bit of a weird thing, kind of like, because it's, it's very kind of natural and new agey sort of the subject matter, but the way that I'm treating it is kind of uh, bright and ghastly. Just red. Pasta is fucking, well, no, all right, no, just a personal bias, to not matter. Uh, no, I'm not. I that you don't know about that. I um, I went to a I did well. I did a talk thing at Rough Trade East in London, and I threw sherbet lemon bonbons at people when they asked a question, or when they answered. A, I can't remember. But no, I don't know. I don't. I'm not. I'm, I don't really eat sweets. You know, I'm all like running. You know, I like fitness. Fitness. I am nothing but fitness. Cheers. The King of Limbs was the, the title of that record. Actually, was I think was the last thing that that the band came to. So we, with that record, there was no title. There was no idea. It was anything to do with with trees at all. So when I started, when they started, when the band started, and I started on on, on the, that project. My idea was to, um, I, I'd just come across the work of uh, a German painter called Gerhard Richter. Um, and he's a, he's a, he's a genius. Um, and I, I'm not, I foolishly thought I could copy his, his work. So I was going to do these sort of photorealistic yet blurred uh, portraits of the band in oil paint because that was going to be the artwork for this record that hadn't been made yet. Because I thought, well, I've never done, um, I've never used the faces of the band in any of the artwork. So I thought, now, let's, why not? Uh, oil paint, why not, you know? Um, and uh, copying Gerhard Richter, why not? But there, it turns out there are very, very good reasons why not for all of those things. Um, not oil paint, because I don't know how to paint. Not portraits because I'm shit at painting portraits, and not pictures of the band for, for both of those reasons. So, um, I what I did was well, I bought a load of oil paint. I bought a load of canvases. I I I, uh, I photographed the band. I'm also a, an appalling photographer, which is just adds to the fucking horror of this whole situation. And I ended up because I don't know how to paint with oils. I ended up with these. They were just brown they looked like i'd kind of got a handful of shit and just smeared it across the canvas they were appalling pictures genuinely appalling and as a sort of consequence i went into a kind of spiraling state of, of misery I, I guess sort of i was quite depressed because i thought you know i'm well everything was that i'd done was was literally looked like shit um, so I didn't know what to do. I really, I really did not know what to do. And I, and I went into uh, the studio where the band were, were making this music, and they, they, they'd done okay, man. They were, they were, they were doing fine. Um, so, and then uh, I said, well, well, okay, play me, play me, play it to me. So they played to me the music. We sat there. Really, you know, this is, you know, so I'm in their, their recording studio. That This is the best this record is going to sound. Huge speakers, um, top end everything, you know. And it's amazing. And it, I'm sitting in this place. Their, their studio was a converted barn with these huge wooden trusses holding up the roof. And these, this building had been raised um, centuries before. And you could still see bits of the bark, you could still see the shape, the form of the trees from which these huge beams have been formed. And I was listening to the music and I was looking at the structure and I felt like I was in a, a cathedral of sound, but a cathedral of wood, a cathedral of 
trees. And I was just like, this, and you can imagine like, who, who, who was there when this tree was a sapling? All of these things that have happened, centuries of tree growth before the tree even comes down, before the tree is made into a barn. And then, I mean, there was so much, there was so much in this building and the music sort of gave life to it. And I was like, oh, okay. And I kind of basically scurried back to my kind of fucked up disaster, disaster zone of a studio and just started painting over these brown fucking dirty protests with, with uh, acrylic. And uh, that, it went from that. Long answer. I right. hope the person who asked the question is very fucking happy. Uh, no, I don't. What? Anything that comes to hand. Uh, uh, I don't write very much anymore, actually. I, I've, um, I've sort of stopped. I've kind of run out of things to write. I'm always like thinking I'd like to, I'd like to write, but I don't know. The sad truth is probably is, is it's my phone or this laptop, you know, sadly. But I, I did, I, when I, it depends what I'm doing really. Because when I was doing that, uh, I, I did a book called Bad Island and that was like, 80 lino cuts or something. So the most, the object I used the most in the two years I was doing that was this fucking tiny little chisel. Yeah, it became like an, an extra sort of appendage. No, uh, maybe, but I mean, I don't think uh, there's much chance of me getting as far as uh, London in the uh, foreseeable future. So. LA looks like fucking fairyland, as far as I can tell. I'm doing all these paintings of um, sort of pop art landscape things. So I'm, I'm doing those, but I'm not quite sure why, because of coronavirus and, you know, obviously we're doing this over Zoom and so on. I'm not quite sure why I'm doing them or where I'm going to show them and what the point of my existence is so so that's that's one so-called project i'm also working on some illustrations to go with the the poetry of uh, a, a late 19th early 20th century writer and poet called thomas hardy so i'm, I'm doing lots of drawings based uh well not based on but around that sort of area in his Uva, which was, was sort of rural life in the south of England. So I'm sort of doing a modern version of that. Uh, and, uh, and something else, which I can't talk about because it's utterly secret. Um, I guess uh, he's got a very different way of looking at things. He's far less jaded and cynical than I am, which is very refreshing. He's, um, he's, uh, he's sort of, def it feels like, I may, I may be wrong, it feels like his sort of default response to a situation is to see the good or the beauty or the joy in that situation, whereas mine is kind of the opposite, mm. which is which is a little sad, but perhaps that's why our, our joint working relationship works. Because that, that's the other way around. I'm, I'm the other way around with, um, with um, Tom, because he's, he's completely miserable. And, but, and then I always see the joy and the, the beauty of, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know, question of degree. Making art and making, uh, I don't make anything else actually. Thinking about it, like in a, in, a, in a properly communist society, I would be a sort of parasite. I don't make anything apart from stupid pictures. So, 
mea culpa. Ah, hum, hum. That's a really difficult question. I'm gonna come back to that one later on. My last meal. Ask me again later. Yes, I have made artwork for a friend of mine, and God, I'm sure I have. Fuck. Oh yes, no, another guy called um, Matthew Herbert. I've made artwork for him. He's Matthew Herbert. He is a very oh. clever musician. He made this record called uh, Plat de Jour that I did the work for. It was, a, it was a concept album, right? But the concept was like modern food production. And he he made, he recorded loads of things. Like he worked with um, Heston Blumenthal. He's a, like a science cook dude. Um, I know. Uh, Matthew would record it. But the best thing that they did, they, they, he did a track that was something to do with George Bush and the war on terror or something. And uh, George Bush had just been to the UK to visit Tony Blair, who was the, the prime minister back then in the olden days. Um, and... Uh, they had a big meal, you know, when, when George Bush came to the UK, like, so that, you know, they're in 10 Downing Street, they have this fantastic meal for the president of the USA, which used to be a respectable job. It's not anymore, is it? But anyway, so they, they have, I mean, George Bush, I mean, <laughs> who would have thought he would have ever looked like a kind of cute, fancy, amiable chimp, but unfortunately he does. Anyway, to make the music, Matthew Herbert, recreated, he got the whole meal, he got the menu, he made it again, he got it all cooked and created. It was all plated on like Staffordshire, China and everything, as it was, 10 Downing Street. And then he set up all his recording stuff and drove a Sherman tank over it. Made a great sound, and he used it. I've heard heroin's better than almost anything. You know, and if, if it didn't kill you, if, you know, if it was, if it had no ill effects and you had a limitless amount of it. But the only thing is I don't, you know, I'd, I'd have to do, I don't like the needle thing. Uh, I wouldn't make a very good intravenous drug user because needles kind of creep me out. It's like a really bad thing. It's like a phobia. You know, having like fucking, when you give blood, I feel, oh, horrible, horrible. Anyway, um, so yeah, probably... I've heard good things about heroin, yeah. Uh, I have never lived in a capital city, so it's impossible for me to answer that question. Hmm. Um, I don't have one. I think uh, they have different... I had to think about that. You thought that was me thinking, mm. that sort of silent, head wobbling bit. Um, I I like lino cut printing for its kind of crudity, immediacy, and and kind of like quick results. I like etching for its delicacy and the complication and sort of I don't know, it's sort of instant, venerable appearance. I like litho printing because it's fucking simple, you know. Inkjet printing because you can just press a button. Yeah, uh, but it's the uh, nothing to write home about. It's a really, really high tech ways of making pictures. Like, I, I don't even know, um, but other people do. If that was a possibility, if I could do anything, I'd like to be put in touch with people who explore the edges of what's feasible to make an image and see what, see what they're doing.
what's the biggest inspiration these days? And I will answer in a very ambiguous way and say everything. Yes, I don't trust taupe. I'm not, I'm not happy about taupe. I'm not quite sure what it is. Taupe. I think it's, quite, I think it's a type of grey, but I'm not sure. See what I mean? Is it grey? Is it blue? Is it a bit greeny? I don't know. It's very, very shady. Nobody knows. See? See what? Hi, I'm Mr. Tope. What do you, what do you, you not like saying I'm Mr. Pink. Mrs. Blue, you know? No, it's Tope. What's Tope? Nobody knows. Okay, Tope, don't trust it. All of the fluorescent colours. Uh, pros, uh, quick, easy, simple. Uh, it's like it's like binary. It's like yes, no. Uh, digital. It's like yeah, yes or no, one or zero. That's all it is. But then, um, to as a corollary to that, then you think that everything we're doing here is digital, which is one or naught. So um, what we are dealing is with here while we're talking. And everyone who's watching or listening, uh, this is basically black and white. So black and white, simple and complicated. The full spectrum. Uh, well, I guess, you know, in my mind, I kind of think that, it, 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 isn't it in physics that every color in the spectrum, every single color is in white and the absence of every color as black. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not a kind of theoretical painter. I don't really know what the opposite of blue is or, or, or the complementary colour of, of, of teal is. But I'm, I, I'm heard the complementary of teal is taupe. Yes, I'm a big fan. Excuse me, just going to have another little bath. Um, yeah, the, um, the black white and red is they're, they're basically my it's my favorite color combination ah, excuse me i used to be a paper boy like delivering papers like years ago when i was a kid early in the morning to make a bit of money and um the the tabloids in those days the the the, the lighter weight papers that were easier to deliver um, and that's what people ordered in the council estates, where you actually got tips at Christmas time, rather than the the, um, the upper and middle class areas where they were just wankers with their big fat papers that weighed a ton and never give you a tip. And you had to go up a massive fucking driveway to put the paper through the door where there'd be a savage hound the other side that would try to take your fingers off. So um, I developed an early liking for, for tabloid newspapers, not for the content really, because it's basically often fascist nonsense, but the look of them. They'd have the, like a, a headline, black, and a photo, black, and, and then the masthead, red. Beautiful for me, very beautiful. Associated with, with, um, with good tips at Christmas and lightweight papers and frequent uh, letterboxes not long driveways. So I, I like red, black and white for that reason. Ah. <laughs> oh God, yes. Yes, wherever everything goes wrong. <laughs> yeah, if you've um, ever read my uh, monograph, available in all bookshops and also from, I believe, Amazon. You all know that every single time I do anything, it's a fucking disaster. And I wish I had another job. Yeah. So yes, yes, all the time. Crud. Yeah. Right, I mean, uh, like, who would actually care? Uh, and probably about 10? I think 10, maybe eight, something like that.
that's quite something. Wow, that's an incredibly accurate rendition of, of a, actually, I, this has got a bit of a weird history, this picture. This okay. one, this drawing was originally made for, um, it was commissioned for Virgin Atlantic's In Flight magazine, by, which was, uh, it was, it was turned down. I think the guy who commissioned it really liked it, but, but then the Virgin Atlantic people, I think it was the sort of destruction side of it. They weren't so keen. And then I think that whole kind of 9-11 thing, that happened. And there was a, just a kind of a bit of a crisis of confidence in air travel generally. So, so that picture was down, that was, that was kicked out. Uh, and then I recreated it um, uh, and uh, because it was just a drawing. I, it, and uh, I put the colour in it, which is what you can see on that, um, that delightful tattoo there. Which, uh, it, again, the colour reproduction is, is astonishing. So, yeah, I think that, that's a, that's a, it's an amazing thing. It's, it, was a, it was about the kind of idea of destructive avatars. So I suppose the whole 9-11 thing that really would have put a kibosh on that for Virgin Atlantic. Yeah, Operation Phantom Fury, I believe, I, I chose that title afterwards when I turned it into a print with, with colour. And I think Operation Phantom Fury was the, t the military, you know, military code names they have for operations. I believe, if my memory serves me right, that was the military code name for the um, military assault on the civilian city of Fallujah in Iraq, which has subsequently become a kind of kind of hotbed of, of uh, what's well, basically ISIS HQ for that area. So that went well, didn't it, Western Alliance? Um, it's a long question. Um, but the answer isn't very much longer, I don't think. Uh, Orphan Ness is, I, I grew up in East Anglia, so I was familiar with Orphan Ness as a secret and forbidden part of the coastline near where I lived. And when the chance came to actually visit it, after the, this was of course after the end of the Cold War when the military had withdrawn, it's now run, funnily enough, by the National Trust. Um, so it was very, it was very, uh, very interesting offer to be able to to go there, and because of uh, Robert had some sort of connection with the National Trust people, so um, we we had access to areas of the um, of the of the site, you know, buildings and so on that, that most people would have been allowed to, to go into, and I, I did get told off for going into some that even we weren't supposed to go into. To take the pictures that ended up that I ended up using as, as sort of source material for for this artwork that's in this in strangeness strangeness so yeah I, there's there, that was the reason really it was um, it was somewhere that Robert could get us to and somewhere I had always been fascinated by you know and, and I, you know I I sort of grew up in the in the Cold War that tail end of the Cold War and I was quite active in campaign for nuclear disarmament so um, to go to a post nuclear site was sort of weirdly fascinating for me bye bye <laughs>